Well, good morning, everyone. So it's good to have everyone here. I got my timer going. It's not going. It's not. Oh, this this means I can preach as long as I want in this service. Oh, three people. All right, that's great. <clears throat> the rest of you are like, can we? Can it just end now? Right? We just sang. It's all good. Let's go home. Hey, a couple things before we get started. Um, one, uh, the set, Eric had mentioned the uh, Vacation Bible School tomorrow. And so as always, the, the folks have done an amazing job uh, with the set. So all those who worked hard on putting it together, great job. <clears throat> and then as Eric mentioned, uh, tom tomorrow with the, what, 350 kids and then 100 plus uh, adults and, and workers, students coming in today, tomorrow, so for the whole week. It is a week that is exhausting. I literally have to work the whole week, right, which is just terrible. So uh, anyhow, uh, pray for us and pray for all the kids that they have a, have a great time. So we're in our series on dating, marriage, and life, <clears throat> and, and I want to just kind of go back and remind you guys, in week number one, two weeks ago, we talked about the hectic schedule that so many of us live, and then the one thing, or the two things rather, that end up getting kicked to the curb in the area of our, our time management, what that looks like. If you missed this service, you can ho hopefully grab a CD on the way, you can always go to the church's website and download it. And then last week we talked about um, lies that we believe about marriage and how they dest have dest uh, uh, destructive consequences uh, in the marriage. And so today we're going to talk about warning great marriages don't just happen. All right. And, and so this is from a class that I taught maybe 15 years ago. And so I just adapted it to a Sunday morning uh, message. But here is the chairs, and this is for a visual aid. So I'm, in a moment, we're going to separate the chairs. But when we start out in premarital counseling, um, and this is what the chairs look like, right? This is, they're, they're right, they're as close as they could possibly be together. They're, they're holding hands, right? They're, they got their, they, they can't do PDA because I'm like, get your hands off of her. You can't do that. And, and so, <clears throat> you, you know, that, that's where they start out, okay? Are you all with me so far? All right. So, so here's what happens in all marriages, not just in some marriages, in all marriages marriages, capital A, capital L, capital L, okay? In all marriages, they experience what's called marital drift, okay? And so it's like the, it's like the first and second law of thermodynamics. When something is built, it begins to destroy itself, okay? So here, here's what it looks like. So they start off here, and they're dating, they're having fun, it's all great, they're loving each other, they got goo-goo eyes and that warm, fuzzy feeling in their stomach, and it's just disgusting, Okay, so all of a sudden, they have a moment, they come down here, they get married, Pastor Dan stands up here and says, I do, I do, I do, I do, kiss, and out the door they go, okay? So then this is when marital drift begins to happen in day two of their wedding. First law of thermodynamics, right? So all of a sudden, the guy realizes that he needs to make more money, right? So I got to get a job, I got to go to college, I have to get a second, you know, certificate, I got to go to, you know, whatever it is, doesn't really matter. And so we have an experience where moves away. She decides, you know what, if I just got that certificate in whatever, and I can just go down and take a six-week class at the school, then, you know, I'll be able to make some more money, and that will be good for us. Okay, are you all with me? Right? So, so then all of a sudden, he decides that he was a terrible athlete in high school, all right? And so he's got to join a team, a baseball, softball team, a soccer team, a whatever team, okay? Because he was not good in high school, and now he's 28, he's good. You with me? So they have practice two days a week. They should be practicing all the time because he's terrible. He was terrible in high school, he's terrible now. So, anyhow, <clears throat> just saying. So all of a sudden, we're experiencing what's called marital drift, which is, at this point, life. Then all of a sudden, a kid's born, right? And that kid, in a twinkle of the eye, <clears throat> is in t-ball or soccer or basketball. And then he's actually fairly good or she's actually pretty good. So they're going to get in the traveling team. And then they have to drive to God knows where. 
All right? So here we are. Right? Now, when you stop and pause in the vast majority of marriages that tend to begin to digress, most of them do not have anything bad. All of that's not bad. In fact, none of it is bad. Kids are in sports. He got a different degree. He got a better job. She got a certificate. All of it's fine. The problem is, is now they sit in. I have to get in camera range. I might be out. All of a sudden, they sit in, and here's the world in which I live in, right? The guy sitting back or the woman sitting back goes, I know you. Don't I? Isn't your middle name whatever, right? And then they say this, but Pastor Dan, I don't love them anymore. Like, what do you mean? Like, what does that mean? Like, you're walking and I fell in love. It's like, whoa, right there's the love hole right there. <laughs> if you step in it, you fall in love, right? So I'm not in that hole anymore. I got catapulted out, and so now I don't love them anymore, okay? Translation. The feeling that I got when we first met, that feeling in my stomach that I would call for us old school, let's watch the Brady Bunch, when they kissed, there was fireworks in the sky, right? That is all emotional, right? Stick your tongue on a nine-volt battery. That's also a thrill, okay? So all of a sudden, they don't have that feeling, and they don't have that feeling because of the drift. It's not bad. In some cases, there are bad things that happen, which is a little bit more of a complicated issue. But in many cases, it's not bad. So, so in my world, it goes like this. So you want to get a divorce. I want to get a divorce, Pastor Dan. Okay, well, you know, God, you know, he, he wants reconciliation. That's really his heart. That's why Jesus came to reconcile us to a holy God. And so tell me a little bit why. Well, I don't feel like I love them right? So then I say, well, tell me, are they a good person? Oh, yeah. He's an amazing father. She's an incredible mother, right? She, she, she is reliable. He's reliable. They're hardworking, right? See where I'm going with this? It's like, okay, so if you kicked him to the curb or you kicked her to the curb, who would you select? Somebody that's a deadbeat? Somebody that's a horrible father or a horrible wife? Somebody who's mean spirit and toxic? Oh, no. I would want somebody that's really nice. You mean like them? If you don't invest in the marriage, it's not going to work. There has to be an investment. In fact, 75% of everybody who divorces get remarried. Which means you are going to invest in the relationship. So if you invest in the one that you currently have, you're better off. So how do you stop what is a natural phenomenon? Again, it doesn't matter if you've been married for five weeks or 55 years. Marital drift is a real thing and it happens. If you do not have a plan to solve this gap you will begin to drift in a separate direction. And if you begin to ask questions to people that you believe has a, has a good marriage, they may not have a game plan per se, but what I'm going to talk about today, they're doing. Okay? So here we go. Let's have a little fun today. You guys in a good mood? <clears throat> so my theory is whenever something's pretty heavy, we always have to have a little laughter so we keep from crying. Okay? So laughter... Okay, I once went to Johnny Carson's show. Every time they wanted someone to laugh, it said laugh right up there, okay? So when I point up there, laugh, I want you to laugh, even if you don't feel it, okay? <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, so Revelation chapter 2, verse, uh, verse uh, 4, this is what John says. And again, this is about the church. Now, this is a relationship with the church in Ephesus and Jesus Christ which is a picture of, of a Christian wedding. Jesus is the groom, the uh, and the church is the bridegroom, right? So, so we are the bride of Christ. And so here, here's what John says in Revelation 2, verse 4. It says, Yet I hold this against you, for uh, you have forsaken your first love, 
And then here's the three action steps, right? Remember the height from which you have fallen, repent, and do the thing, the things you did at first. Okay? So, so let's just kind of quickly go through these. So he says the first thing we are to do is we are to remember, right? And, and so you may have to be creative in your relationship to remember the good times. And if your marriage is fractured, you have to be super creative because human nature is to think about the negative. We talked about this a couple weeks, last week I think it was. And, and so we, we have the mindset. It's like, tell me one good thing about your, your husband. It's like, just one? Right? You don't have any? Have none. Tell me what's bad. 97,000. Right? So our mindset automatically goes there. So you have to be creative in that. What good times did you have? What good experiences did you have? Be because he here's the funny thing, all right? I've never had a person come to me and go, hey, Pastor Dan, I want you to introduce you to my fiance, right? Um, she's ugly. She's got a terrible personality. She is toxic. She nags all the time. She's not fun to be with. She is horrible. Save the date, August 5th, we're getting married. <laughs> right? And you could flip it on the guy, doesn't matter. The guy's a dork, he's whatever, whatever, you know. No, no one has ever done that. So something draws you to them. So what is it? Remember it. Second one is to repent. And repent doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong. Repent means you change direction. So if I'm repenting, it goes, I'm going this way, and God reveals in my heart an area that I need to change, and so I repent, I, cho I choose to change direction and go in a different way. So in the marriage, you have to make a choice to go in a different direction if you're experiencing marital drift, okay? And then the third thing in your outline is to do, and that's where we're going to focus at today, and, and, and that is there's action steps that need to take place um, in, in the marriage because it's easier to fall into love than it is to stay into love, right? That's just, it's just a fact of the way that, that it works. And again, you know, my, my experience has been that the vast majority of marriages are in existence and it's a partnership, right? Which is not really the biblical picture of what it needs to be. So a couple things real quick. Those thoughts, feelings, actions in your outline and, and that is, you've heard me say that before, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so oftentimes in the marriage, we're focusing on the action, right? <clears throat> it, it's all about the outcome, outcome, outcome. But in order to get the outcome base to happen, happen, you have to have the feelings, because that feelings is what's going to actually turn into action. And in order for feelings to happen, you have to have thoughts, right? So when we begin to think that we're in love, we will feel that we're in love, and then we will act like we're in love. Okay, are you all with me? <clears throat> and then, and then in, my, in your outline is a line of encouragement. It's a, how a relationship deteriorates. And so it starts out as romance, right? Can't wait to be with them. And then reality sets in. Then you find yourself in a rut. Then you experience resentment. And this is where bitterness kicks in. And ultimately regret. Okay, so there's, there's the five R's of the deterioration of a relationship. All right? So I'm going to give you five ingredients that is going to help you ultimately to close the gap in, in, your, in your marriage. Doesn't matter if you got married last Sunday or you've been married for a thousand years. This is something that you need to work on in your life. Okay? So here we go. Number one in your outline is attention. The first ingredient is attention, all right? <clears throat> when you think about in Philippians um, chapter 2, verse 2, he says, if, if, uh, if you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, verse 2, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose, and this is the idea of the oneness that ultimately spiritually happens in a, in a marriage. Uh, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. Verse 4, right, each of you should look 
not only at your own interest, and we'll stop there in the comma. The, 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 the thought is implied in the text is by nature, you look to your own interest. When you get a group picture, a family picture, the first person that you look at in that picture is you. And if you look good, it's a keeper. <laughs> right? If you're kind of going off and all the kids and grandkids are all looking at the camera, it's like, next, take two. Right? Am I right? But also to the interest of others. Right? So it's a choice that we're making that we're going to look in a different direction. Okay, So let's go back into elementary school or grade school uh, for, for us. If we go back to that day, you remember that time when all of a sudden someone caught your attention. right? And you noticed that boy or girl, whatever it was, right, for you. And all of a sudden you began to be pretty creative to figure out when the class was going to end and where their locker was in the hallway of whatever room they were in. And you magically appeared right in front of their locker to get their attention. Are you with me? You were extremely creative in that. You would write cards. You would make phone calls. Remember the old days where your, your mom's like, who's been slobbering on the phone? And so wiping up. Flowers, gifts, you know, and, and, all, and all those kinds of things. We, were, we would become incredibly creative when it came to that attention, right? And, and, and so, so what happens is, think about this. If you've ever thought you really needed something and you did an online research, you know, whatever, you found it, you bought it, and within a few months, you don't even know where it's at, Right? Our garages are filled with, our closets are filled with, our shoe racks are filled with things that we had to have. But as we've owned them, we lose interest in them, right? And all of a sudden, they get shuffled into a corner. We don't even know they're at. All the, we trip into our closet one day, and we find them. We go, I haven't worn that shirt in like eight years, right? So it's kind of one of those things, okay? So, so here's what, here's what a, a, a survey has figured out. In, in surveying and couples... They found that in the dating process, the average couple would spend 15 hours of undivided attention a week to begin to create that emotional connection, right? So fast forward into a marriage. If 15 hours a week of undivided attention was what began to create it, guess what we need in our, in our, in our marriage? We need 15 hours a week right, of that undivided attention, not small talk, not, hey, it's garbage night, don't forget the kids in the school, but, you know, that's just the grind of life, but, but actually talking about really what's taking place. So let's have a little fun with the men, because the men want to have fun with me today, right? So, and I have a PhD in menhood, and so, <clears throat> so here's the way it works. 99.9% .9 of men are goal-oriented. Okay, and, and so it, it doesn't mean that you have a list of goals and you're like a high achiever and all that stuff. You don't even know where the pen and paper's at, but in your mind, you have goals. So the way it works is this. One day you wake up. We don't know when that is, but one day you wake up and you think, you know what I need? I need a wife. So then I begin to go through, because I'm old school. That's funny. The old days, you had to go to places where the ladies were at. Now you just look on an app, okay? And that was meant to be a joke. So all of a sudden, you find that special person, right? And you want to begin to be creative to get their attention. Okay? Are you all with me? So a guy will do almost anything to get the woman's attention for her to be wooed to him. We will go places that we will never go again after we say I do. <laughs> Come on, be honest, right? You, when you were dating, it's like, oh, no, honey, I do. I want to go to San Francisco, and I definitely want to see the ballerina show. <laughs> now, I said it earlier about someone. Someone came out. They go, oh, you know, they're a trained opera singer. And I'm like, I still love him. He, he's actually a good dude. So <clears throat> you'll go to that. You'll watch, you know, guys wear tutus. Until you say, I do. 
And then when you say, I do, and she's like, I got tickets, you're like, can you invite your girlfriend to go with you? I'm not going to do that again. Am I right? So we become creative to get their attention, and this is why wives will think that there was a bait and switch, because it was like when before you were doing all this stuff, you say, I do, and now you really mean I don't. Right? And the reason why is because you're goal-oriented. And so a man, his goal was to get married. Check. So now he's going to begin to go in his career, his schooling, his whatever. And that becomes the next goal, to buy a house, to get a car, to, you know, whatever it is. And, and so we're moving on, and, and, and the wife is not moved on yet. And she's wondering what happened. Right? So there has to be a plan in the relationship where you want to spend that, that, that time with your spouse. And, and so I, I like to say it this way, that if, if your spouse is into sports and you don't know anything about sports, you need to love sports because you love the person who loves sports. Right? If, if your spouse loves guys dancing in tutus, you need to dig guys dancing in tutus because your spouse loves those shows and therefore you love her or him, whatever that looks like. Are you all with me on that? Right? So there has to be that desire to, to, want, to uh, want to do that in, in, the, in the relationship. So here's the point in your outline is that you must make time for each other. If you do not create a plan to close the gap, the gap will continue to get bigger. And, and by the way, it used to be in the 90s that in, in family counseling, that if you made 20 to 25 years in marriage, you were bulletproof, you weren't going to divorce. That is no longer the case. There are a huge number of people getting divorced when 20 to 25 years now that in the past never happened. All right? Never happened. And so uh, in your outline, the enemy of, of romance is a bu busy schedule. We talked about that last week. Uh, the University of uh, Nebraska did a study, both religious and non-religious uh, marriages, and they found that the common denominator was that the people spent time together, okay? And some family therapists will tell you five to 15 minutes a night of communicating heart to heart it will radically change your, your, your marital situation, okay? So the first one is attention. Intellectual intimacy. The next, the next one is affirmation, and this is emotional, right? This is the emotional side. In, in 1 Thessalonians, it says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. And, and this, this is the important part. This is where you, you have the, the appreciation and the value of the person goes up. Everybody loves their house to appreciate. Everybody loves, you know, whatever their investment to appreciate. And so we want our relationship to appreciate. So in, in children uh, discipline, it's a seven to one ratio. Seven positive things for every one negative thing, right? In a relationship, it's the same way, right? It's the same thing. You need to have, uh, you need to have seven to one, seven to one positive things for one negative. So here's the, here's the deal too for, for guys. Again, this is me preaching to you guys, is that the wife processes information differently than the man does, right? My, my wife and I watch some show, and there's this couple that's on a survival thing. I eat, <coughs> they're watching, they're surviving through, like, New Zealand or something like that. So I lay in my bed eating ice cream while they're starving to death. I don't know. It's kind of a weird <laughs> thing I do. But anyhow, so, so one of the couples divorced, right? And she, <laughs> she was talking. She's like, oh, we're just so different. I mean, he processes things like linear and like step by step, and I'm much more emotional, and I just start laughing. I'm like, wow, that's, a, that's weird. I've never heard that before, <laughs> right? That, but that is true, and the, and the sad part, funny part is the vast majority of people who are married have no idea that a woman processes things differently than a man does. And so the man thinks, I'm going to meet my needs like I want, and my, your wife is totally different. So when, when we speak as guys, we're speaking, we're, we're speaking in a way of, of just kind of laying out the facts. The wife receives it emotionally, which means that everything is tangled up and spinning together, right? So therefore, on a guy's behalf, it becomes so crucial that we think 
about what we're going to say and how she's going to receive it. It may not be the wrong thing to say. It may not be the right package to put it in. Okay, are you all with me? And, and so it's just important that, that we have that. Romans chapter 12, it says, honor one another above yourselves. And, and again, I think this is where the, the verbalization of our love and the acts of our love or the action of our love is important. If the marriage is hindered, we don't pay attention to words we only watch actions because words are empty. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I'm going to change. You never change, right? Words mean nothing. But in a healthier marriage, you're looking for both words and actions in it, okay? So here's some uh, from 1990, terms of endearment, okay? You got a favorite pet name for your spouse? So here, here's some of them, honey, baby, sweetheart, dear, lover, angel, pine. I have no idea what that is. Precious, beautiful, darling, sugar. Okay, here's what not to say. You ready? Love puppy, wild thing, and stud dumplings. <laughs> so if you've been calling your spouse a stud dumpling, that's your problem, right? <laughs> There's no hope for you on, on, on the situation. So we need to make sure that we do that. But the value of, of breathing value into your spouse is ginormous. It is huge, all right? Number three in your outline. The third one is affection, not affliction, and the spelling is very close, but different, and the actions are incredibly different, right? So this is affection, this is the physical intimacy, and so um, in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 19, it says, husbands be affectionate in the amplified version of that. So if you ever read anything on the Puritans, um, if, you, if you ever want a great devotional book about people who love God and love the Word of God, it's the Puritans. There's a lot of great stuff. The name sounds a little bit different, <laughs> Puritans, but they had an incredibly high view of meeting each other's needs in a marriage, right? So much that they actually practiced church discipline if the needs in the marriage weren't being met. So here's the way that it would look. If your needs were not being met by your spouse, you would contact the pastor. The pastor would go and have a conversation with your spouse. And if they thought, you know, that's true, then they would have that conversation with you like, you got to meet their needs. Okay? If it didn't self-correct, the next step was they were going to announce it in church. Okay? So here's how it would look. Monday is an exciting day. We're going to have over 350 kids and 100 plus adults for vacation Bible school. Pray for us. And by the way, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so is not meeting the needs of their spouse. Okay? Following me? If that didn't change anything, they actually excommunicated them out of the church. Which made me think. Does anybody want to email me? It's Father's Day next week. Right? That's funny. Okay. <laughs> so, but, but it, it isn't, it, it's interesting to me that they had such a high view of that, that they actually would do church discipline. And church discipline is, is a thing, right? I mean, there's something about it. But um, what, what's kind of interesting also in, in the midst of that is uh, during the uh, USSR, the Russia bloc, the communist bloc, um, there was an enormous amount of orphans. Orphans, in fact, I know, actually know some that got uh, adopted out of Russia into American families. And um, what they found in those children that were being born in those orphanages is that many of them would be uh, developly delayed, and, and many of them would actually die. And they came up with a term from that, and the term was skin deprivation, meaning that the child was basically put in a crib, and that was their existence. Someone would come in and feed them, someone would change their diaper, and that was it. And their lack of skin contact actually deterred them from developing, in many cases, they died. And so it is actually a real thing. The University of uh, uh, UCLA did a study, and they found that if a woman hugs her husband three times a day, it actually increases his lifespan by three years, which got me thinking, <laughs> right? So that means if your wife stopped hugging you, you may want to check your life, uh, your life insurance policy. 
Which brings a whole new thing about she's killing me. <laughs> That's funny. All right. Genesis chapter 26, verse 8 says this. It says, Isaac was sporting with his wife, uh, with, with Rebecca, his wife. And, and that word sporting has three meanings. Laughter, enjoyment, and caressing. Okay, so some guy wrote in the commentary, he said that this was the first sport invented. There is no season, and he said, which I wouldn't agree with, that you can do it indoors or outdoors. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right, so, so then, so you have, you have attention, affirmation, uh, affection, and then number four in your outline is adventure. Right, and, and this is one that I think is important of closing the gap, and oftentimes, again, because a, a woman thinks differently than men, and actually, recreational support is one of the f high qualities or one of the top three qualities that a man needs in his life. Right. So again, whether you know you, they take up golfing or they go to a baseball game or they go fishing or camping, whatever the person's hobby is, but that they're, they're doing it. And again, the idea is that they may not like it, but they love the person who likes it and therefore they're investing in it. Right. And, and so this this is one of those areas that has the potential of significantly closing the gap, because when you were dating, you were doing things together. Right. And, and now all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're not going to do it. And we need to make sure that we're, we're bringing that together, because what ends up happening in life is that we determine that when the f when the work is over, the fun will start. The problem is, is the work is never over. Right. Whether you've been married for one day or a thousand years, whether you have zero kids or 90 kids, the work is never over. Right. So so then it's like, hey, let's do something. I got something I got to do. Right. Hey, let's go. I got something I got to do. Right. And, and, and I think it becomes something that we need to make sure that we're looking through. A hectic schedule is not helpful in, in the in the relationship. And so a homework assignment that back in the day when I did this as a class is that you had to, you had to have a date night out. And that was part of the thing in the next class. You would come in and describe what the date night out was. So I suggest to you that if you're married, that you have at least one night out or one night a month out with your spouse. No kids. Right. And, and it's like, well, I can't afford it and all this other stuff. It doesn't it doesn't cost anything to walk around a park to go up to the, the, the black diamond mines and, and go for a hike to sit on a park bench. You can make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You don't have to have anything fancy, but it's the importance of spending your time together. So, again, in a loving way, people say, well, we can't afford it. Well, if you don't, you're going to be paying a guy or a woman 400 bucks an hour to figure out how to cut this thing in half, okay? You're gonna pay one way or the other. And, and so you need to make sure that you're investing in that uh, uh, at the, at the, uh, in the relationship, amen? amen? All right, number five. The fifth one is accordance, and that is the spiritual intimacy. And, and again, I, this should have been number one, but I wanted to end with it. So we have attention, affirmation, affection, adventure, in accordance, and this is where the spiritual oneness begins to take place. This is what makes different a Christian wedding and marriage versus a non-Christian wedding and marriage. It is where the scripture says, and the two will become one. It doesn't mean that they're no longer two individuals. They are. They have their own interests, their own personalities, their own traits, their own failures, their own flaws. But when they have the Christian unity, then you have one purpose, one goal, and one value, right? And so just as a baseball team or a football team or a basketball team may have multiple players that play different positions, the end is always the same. It's to win the championship. So in a Christian marriage, it is to finish strong till death do us part. Not as roommates, but actually as people who passionately love each other. Right, that, that we're going to end strong in that. And so in Acts 2 is a picture of uh, the New Testament church. Again, it's a picture of the bride of Christ in the, in the church. And it says, and now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all uh, with one accord in one place. Right, there, there's that, that spiritual unity that Christ gives us as he begins to knit the heart of the people together. Okay, so pay attention. So there's some statistics by Barna 
that says that when a Christian couple practice worship together, community or Bible study together, and spiritual disciplines in the home, that they decrease their rate of divorce by 20 to 30% of what the standard population is. Okay, now hear me. That doesn't mean that the person comes to church on Sunday when it's convenient. Okay, it means that they're practicing spiritual discipline in their heart. They're living out their faith. They're not playing games, they're not pretending, they're not perfect, but that they're, they're passionate about growing in their relationship, okay? In a couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about dating. The number one don't in dating is to date a person who is not increasing your passion for Jesus. I have one word for that. Spell it. R U in run because if they are not pushing you spiritually in your life they are not going to be a fit and i've had these experiences where wonderful women and it tends to be this with with guys not being interested in spiritual things and i will, will admit back when tammy and i were dating she goes like let's go to church i'm like i'm not going to church i don't have time for that okay so I was that guy. I know what that guy looks like. So, so what, what happens is, and I had these two occasions that were two days apart. Tr true story. Neither of them knew this, the conversation. They came to me. They were a part of our church. Wonderful husbands. They came to church on Easter, Christmas Eve, and whenever we had a special occasion. Okay? They were great fathers, great husbands, great providers. I liked them. I would bump into them at the stores around town. They were very neat, nice guys. Okay, but both of the ladies told me this privately. They said, if I had it all over again, I wouldn't have married them. And it, it, it you know, I was like 30 something years old. I'm like, what, 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 is, what does that mean? Does that mean a divorce? Oh, no, 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 we're not going to get a divorce. But spiritually, I am lacking because my husband doesn't love Jesus as much or more than I do. And, and I, you know, from a guy, to, next week will be Father's Day. Father's Day is the least attended Sunday of the year. Okay? So we have to make sure that we're passionate about leading and that, that we're, we're, you know, whether we're dating, you know, what that looks like, that, that our spouse is encouraging us in that area of spiritual oneness in our hearts. Look with me in the outline, and we'll be getting out of here in a minute. So in, in an outline, I got it from a pastor friend of mine. I thought it was brilliant. I don't know if he thought of it or got it from somewhere else. Go to the triangle there. We got the triangle. There we go. So we have God at the top. You have the husband and wife at the bottom, okay? <clears throat> if the wife and the husband are growing in their spiritual life, where are they, what are they doing? They're growing to God, but they're also growing to together, right? If one is growing... They're still the same distance apart, right? And, and so this is where we're either going in the same direction with our spouse or we're going in a different direction with our spouse. And this is where the scripture talks about being unequally yoked, right? And, and again, through the years, you know, I have, you know, ladies come in. And it's like, oh, I got a boyfriend. And I'm like, oh, good. Congratulations. Does he go to church? And they get this like deer in the headlight look. So well, why don't you just bring their Bible? Maybe they have some inserts from the church service that they were in. Deer in the headlight look, right? Well, do you ever have spiritual talks? Well, once I sneezed and he said, God bless you. <laughs> and it's like, that's it? I mean, so we're going we're gonna to classify them as a believer bec because of that? You, you see, and then all of a sudden, we have the I do thing, and it's not the unity we're unequally yoked in our in our walk with the lord so ephesians chapter 5 verse 18 says this do not be drunk with wine which leads to debauchery instead be filled with the spirit speak to one another in psalms hymns and spiritual songs singing and making music in your heart to the lord verse 21 submit to one another because he takes out the trash <laughs> submit to one another because she cooks right you can change it however you want 
submit to one another because they do the laundry, because they mow the lawn. Is that what it says? No, it says submit to one another out of the reverence uh, for Christ. We don't submit to our spouse because they deserve it. We submit to our spouse because we love Jesus. Okay? So, so when you get in this, we looked at this tit for tat, right? Well, I'm not going to submit to him because he's not submitting to me. You know, all that. You're just playing a game. You're going to lose. At the end of the day, you're going to lose. Right? At some point, someone needs to. And so he says, submit to one another out of the reverence for Christ. And then he gives the direction. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Right? In verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, we talked about this last week. He died for it. Right? So it's important that we begin to recognize from our spiritual unity that both of us are what I call dual submission. We're submitting to each other. We're submitting to the Lord. And as we are, we're actually going toward the pyramid, the top of the pyramid, the apex of, of God himself. Right? And, and so in our relationship, if we're not making plans to do that, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have the chair go off the stage. And it's going to end in a bad situation because by nature, it's going to decline. And this is the reality of what's called marital drift. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and grace. Father, thank you for this opportunity to gather today. And Lord, I recognize that there are times where it's, it's hurtful perhaps in some of our relationships. There's areas that you're working in our hearts. And Lord, I just pray that we would take that step of faith, that we would trust you, that we would believe in you, that we would walk in you. Lord, that you would do the miraculous in our marriage, that you would draw us to each other regardless of what's taking place in the past, that you will begin to draw and make that gap smaller in our relationship. And for the relationships that are here and those who are watching online, God, I just pray that your hand of blessing will be upon it, that you will make it only as you can, only as the masterful hand of God can make it. And Father, we're just grateful for it. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you're here or you're watching online today and you've never given your life to Christ. And that is really the first step in a godly relationship is inviting Jesus into your life. And so if that's where you're at, then invite Jesus in your heart and that's where you feel you're at. I'm gonna say a prayer, just ask you to repeat silently these words that I say, not out loud, just silently, just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I've missed the mark. And Lord, I believe that Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess you to be my Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Lord, thank you for making me a new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said... Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me, there's a communication card. You can check the box on the back of that and uh, drop it in the box on the way out. So next week is Father's Day. So I look to see that the place will be filled with a bunch of men who want to know about Jesus. Amen? Amen? So prove me wrong. God bless you guys. Have a great week. What an incredible experience. Remember, we go live every weekend, so be sure to hit subscribe on our channel so you can be notified whenever we upload new content. I also want to invite you to join us for an in-person service when you get a chance. Joining us for one of our in-person services is a great way to meet and interact with new people in our Laurel Ridge family. You can find out more about Laurel Ridge and activities for your whole family by visiting our website. And we can't wait to see you next time. Until then, have a great week and remember, God loves you.